So we're in a series called The Kings of Babylon. And we're talking about the four kings that reigned during the seven year exile when Israel was in captivity of Babylon. And to, today we're gonna to talk about Belshazzar. Now let me just let you know, if you do some study on this, um, that Belshazzar was ruling, he's Daniel chapter five, we read Daniel's one through four last week, parts of it, but he actually wasn't the king, he was the crown prince. The king was Nabonidus. Let me say it again, Nabonidus. Uh, Nabonidus was actually, though, traveling most of the time and building altars for the god, little god, little g, of sin. That was, the, that was the name of the god he served, sin. And he traveled around Arabia for about 10 years doing that, uh, mainly in Arabia, but he traveled other places. So he put his son in as the king of Babylon, and he was called the king, but actually Nabonidus was the king. Does everyone follow me? Okay, so the Bible tells us about Belshazzar because Belshazzar from 556 B.C. to 539 B.C. was the king 17 years, even though his father was actually the king. But his mother was Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. So he's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar that we started with last week, all right? So what we're actually going to do is Daniel 5 is so good, we're going to read the whole chapter. And I'm going to make comments throughout it. Isn't that something, though, that in church we're going to read the Bible? <laughs> so, <laughs> I was talking to one, one of the guest speakers, and he said, do you have any requests? I said, just make sure you read the Bible. So just make sure somewhere you get the Bible. And I was just joking with him. Obviously, he was a great Bible teacher. But I'll, I'll make comments throughout, and then well, I've, I've got three points but this first part will take almost half the message and then we'll hit the three points, okay. All right, so Daniel 5, verse one. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. So think about that, a thousand of his rulers. By the way, Babylon became the leading city in the world and uh, had the, they, most historians believe it was the largest city in the world, had a population of about 200,000 people. So it was, it was pretty big. A thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem. Now, now before we go on, let me comment on that a minute. Because many people then think, well, uh, it says his father was Nebuchadnezzar. Cultural, historical, and biblical language will call the grandfather, the great-grandfather, any ancestor the father. I want you to think about all the times that God said, your fathers, plural. Well, it didn't mean they had multiple fathers. It meant they had multiple fathers, grandfather, great-grandfather, you follow me? Uh, God would also identify himself even as your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? So, and let me just say something, because some of your fathers... But some of you are like I am. You're so good at being a father, you are now a grandfather. I mean, I'm not just a father. I'm grand at it. Just wanted you to know. And then some of our apostolic elders, James Robinson, Pastor Olin, and Pastor Jack, they've been so good at it, they've now become great grand fathers. Okay, everyone get this? Okay, so when it says your father, Nebuch the, it's the father Nebuchadnezzar, it's talking about his grandfather. Okay, all right. He had taken from the temple that which had been Jerusalem. Oh, I needed to mention that. When Nebuchadnezzar raided the land, he took the vessels that had been dedicated to the temple and brought them into uh, Babylon. I want you to think about now, Belshazzar gets things that were dedicated to God from the temple and took them for his own use. This is the tipping point with God when God said, that's it. That's enough. Because you have taken what belongs to me. And watch what he does. He and his king, the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink wine from them or drink from them. 
Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods, little g, of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Now, you can remember that probably, gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Because in a moment, you're gonna see that God gives Daniel divine revelation about this, because Daniel is not at this party, all right? In the same hour, they're drinking from the vessels that belong to God. By the way, I don't have time to develop that, but think about that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're the vessels that belong to God now, okay? All right, so in the same hour, this is the story, you heard this, but this is where it happened. The fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. The king saw, now this is a word that jumped out at me, and the word see, hear, and know jumped out at me, and that's what we're gonna talk about in a moment. The king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, I would, I would assume it did, <laughs> and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. <laughs> I like how God likes to freak people out. I did, the, the, the study I did was, this was the first time knees knocking together had ever been mentioned in any historical document. Now, possibly you might find something, I couldn't find any other place, but you know how you say you got so afraid my knees knocked together, okay. We, we, I believe, and I guess most would believe, this is where it comes from, all right? The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, Nebuchadnezzar did that as well when he couldn't interpret something. The king spoke saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple, have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, just to remind you, the reason he would be the third ruler is because Belshazzar was actually the second ruler. The first was his father who was out doing these, building these temples to the God of sin, okay? So that's why. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. The queen, so this is his mother, who is also, because remember his father is actually the king, this is his mother, who's the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. The queen, because of the words of the kings and his lords, came to the banquet hall. So she wasn't at this debauchery that was going on. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. She's talking about Daniel. And in the days of your father, think about again, she's talking about Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, Light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, now she's, she's basically saying that because she could have been killed. Because he had that power to do that. And so she's trying to be very respectful, but she's also trying to say, don't forget who my dad is. Okay? Your father the king made him chief, that's Daniel, of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now, do you see the similarities between the two names, Belshazzar and Belteshazzar? Okay, Bel, it, you, most of you have heard this, Bel, it means God in their language. Because they said when they were many times Israel worshiped Baals, okay? So it means God, but in this time frame, they felt like that the king was God. Even though there were the gods, he was the main God. 
So Baal means protector of the gods or protector of the king. So uh, Nabonidus names his son protector of the king so he can go out and do these temples and basically you'll protect my kingship while I'm gone. But Nebuchadnezzar names Belteshazzar, Daniel Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar means protector of the king's wife. Now think about how God can orchestrate the circumstances because the queen, who's the king's wife, comes and she could be killed, and yet God has already planned that Daniel, who would interpret the dream, would be called in Chaldean, in Babylonian language, in Chaldean language, but in Babylon, the one who protects the king's wife. And it's just kind of amazing how all this stuff fits together. She says, now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel, now watch, who is one of the captives from Judah? He's basically trying to remind him of his place. You're, you're a slave, so you better remember your place here. He's really scared of him. One of the captives from Judah, who my father, the king, brought from Judah, I have heard of you. Okay, this is another word that jumped out at me. That Belshazzar had seen the things of God. He had heard of the things of God. Uh, you know what? That reminds me. I never gave you the title of the message. And... and I did that on purpose just to get intrigue. <laughs> uh, so the title is The Stubbornness of Pride. So we talked last week about the seductiveness of pride, but now we're talking about the stubbornness of pride. And we're gonna show you because of Belshazzar, I think he represents stubbornness, okay? All right, because he had saw, he'd heard, and he'd known, but he didn't really believe. He'd heard all that. All right, so he says, I've heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me, again, see, hear, and know, or the three words that jumped out to me. It's interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation to the king, and I've heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple, have a chain of gold around your neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Now let me just say something. Basically what he's saying is, I'll do this, but I don't need you to try to bribe me because God takes care of me. Very pure here in Daniel. Uh, you're going to see later in the passage, I'll just go ahead and explain it, that he actually takes the, 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 the robe, and the, the, uh, the purple robe, the gold, and, and it is made third in the kingdom. I think he does it because once he interprets it, he realizes Belshazzar is about to be killed and a new king's coming in. And he, need, he wants the guy to say, now why are you one of the rulers? Why are you the third guy? And I, I really believe he wants to uh, be able to give counsel to this new king for the purposes of God. So I think his heart's pure in this. I, I, I'm sure it is, obviously. Verse 18, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Now before I read this next line, Remember that Belshazzar was kind of sarcastic to Daniel. He kind of spoke down to him. He said, are you one of the captives? Aren't you just a slave? I've heard of you. Just want to remind you of your place. Watch Daniel because most people don't pick up on this. He comes back at him with some sarcasm. He's talking about Nebuchadnezzar now. He says, whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up, and whomever he wished, he put down. Here's what he was saying. You gotta remember, Belshazzar was not the king, he was the crown prince. He, in essence, was reminding Belshazzar of his place. One of the reasons that Belshazzar, I think, was so um, 
um, stubborn was because he wanted to be the king, but he never really was. And he kept being reminded of that all the time. So Daniel, I personally believe, decides, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the real king, he did what he wanted to do. He just kind of throws a little jab in there, all right? But then he goes on about Nebuchadnezzar. But when his heart was lifted up, verse 26, and his spirit was hardened in pride, that's what we've been talking about, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men, his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, again, uh, the word father could be translated ancestor, the word son could be translated descendant. You, his descendant, or grandson. You, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. Again, I'm gonna hit these three words. You saw it, you heard it, and you knew it, but because of your pride, you were stubborn. That's what he's saying. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your Lord, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. Now watch the very same statement of earlier, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Okay, how did Daniel know that? Except by divine revelation. Because see, Daniel wasn't at this party. They had to call him, remember? So it's amazing. He knew what they'd done. Then here are these three words, and this is the first time they stood out to me in the passage. As I went back and read the passage, then they stood out to me more. He said, you praise these gods, what? which do not see or hear or know. Here's what he's saying. You have praised gods that can't see you, they can't hear you, and they can't know you personally. But I know a God that can see you, that can hear you, and that can know you. And not only that, you can see him, you can hear him, and you can know him. You can see his works and you can hear his voice, and you can know him personally. So that's, that's where we're gonna, we're gonna focus in on, right? And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written, meany, meany, tekel, you parson. Meaning, meaning, tech, or you parson. Now, we're gonna keep reading, but let me explain to you what these mean, okay? And this is why most people believe that Daniel easily just saw the interpretation. Uh, in the Hebrew language, there are no consonants. I mean, no vowels, pardon me. There are only 22 consonants. Now, let me, please, please hear me. They've added vowels to be able to understand it better. But back then, there were no consonants. So the way you read was simply like meany, you just saw the M and the N. Also, Hebrew is written from right to left. This is probably why the Chaldeans and the soothsayers couldn't understand it, and God wrote it right to left, and immediately he saw NM, TKL, and PRS, Parson. The U of the last word simply means and. That's all it means. So it was meany, meany, saying it twice to get your attention, tekel, and then it would be and, parson, or perez, actually P-R-S in the Hebrew, okay? All right, so this is what it means. And I'm gonna read it to you in just a moment. You'll see it, but I wanna tell you first. M-N means mina in Hebrew. It means... It, 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 is, it, it refers to, let me say that, it refers to 50 shekels, but it means numbered. That's what it actually means. Mina means numbered. Tekel is the word for shekel. 
T-K-L, means shekel. It refers to one shekel, and a shekel, the, the, the meaning of it is weighed. In other words, when you weigh something, you see how heavy it is, weighed. Parson, or Perez, P-R-S in Hebrew, means divided. It actually referred to a half shekel, half. It was, a shekel was half, in half. But the word itself means divided, okay? So let me tell you what these words again mean. Numbered, weighed, and divided. And the and is in there in the U. Numbered, weighed, and divided. Now watch, now watch as we read on, you'll be able to see this. But you might not have ever seen this if you hadn't studied some Hebrew or had someone tell you about it. This is the interpretation of each word. Meaning, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed, that's what it means, remember, in the balances and found wanting. Perez, which is again the Hebrew for parson, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple, put a chain of gold around his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede, Darius, the Medes and Persians had come together. Cyrus is a Persian, Darius is a Mede. Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. All right, so what do we wanna talk about? We wanna talk about stubbornness, which comes from pride. Please remember this, Babylon, many people don't realize, comes from the Tower of Babel. That's where it comes from. Babel means confusion. When you put the on on the end of it, it means sown, like S-O-W-N, not like you sow something with needle and thread, but like you plant something. So it means sown in confusion. Uh, if you want to babble, again, means confusion. Um, think about, have you ever talked about, a, have you ever said something like, that person just babbles on and on? Babble on. <laughs> there it is right there. <laughs> now, I'm not calling them a bad person. I'm just simply saying, you probably won't be able to understand what they're saying. It's just like it's a Tower of Babel. They just babble on and on. All right, so that's where it comes from. So here's point number one about Belshazzar. He saw, but he didn't look. He saw, but he didn't look. Moses, it said, saw the burning bush and turned aside to look. Belshazzar saw, probably as a little boy, all these things that happened to his grandfather. He saw that God was at work. He saw the true God. He knew the true God. But he never stopped to look for himself to have a personal encounter with God. This um, talks about that he went and got the holy vessels and he brought them in. Okay, obviously this refers to the tithe. Obviously. He takes what is holy and he brings it in and uses it for himself. Now, I spent four weeks talking about stewardship <clears throat> Pastor Jimmy spent four weeks talking about, uh, other than the last week when he was sick, talking about giving. I'm not gonna focus on this a lot, but I do wanna say this, okay? In my life, I have shown people verses straight out of the Bible about tithing, and here's what I feel like they do. They see them, but they don't look. It shocks me, it shocks me. Bring the tithe into the storehouse and yet they don't tithe. Here's one, Jesus himself in the New Testament. So this blows away every argument you could ever have, by the way. First of all, it's in the New, because most people say what's in the, in the Old. All right, I, I, I show people a scripture from the New, from the words of Jesus, where Jesus himself, guess what he says? Listen to this, you ought to tithe. That's pretty clear. Now, the non-tithers aren't laughing right now. <laughs> and if you want to know where it is, it's Matthew 23, 23. So it's easy to remember. 23, 23. First book of the New Testament. You ought to, he says, you tithe on all these little spices, but you neglect justice, mercy, and faith. 
These you ought to have done without neglecting, leaving the others undone. So Jesus says you ought to. Okay, now, here's the thing though. That's been a strength for me for 30 years. But I understand if it's not a strength in your life. But you could probably say, well, Pastor Robert, I've struggled in that area, but you struggled in some areas too. So I could point the finger right back at you. Listen to me. Yes, you can. I never feel like that I'm preaching to you. Never. I always feel like I'm preaching to us. I feel like God gives a word to me for us. It's for us. So I struggle in some areas too. And I've been honest about that. One of the areas I've struggled in is eating right. That's one of the areas I've struggled in. I, I love ribs. I love bluebell. I love potato chips. I, I love that stuff. And I've had people say to me, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I've seen it, but I haven't looked real closely at it. So when I talk about tithing, don't feel like there he is. There he is. Okay, I understand you have some areas you're struggling in. I have some areas. Let me say another way. We have some areas that we're stubborn in. We all do, follow me? So I'm gonna give you a key that's gonna blow you away. Are you ready? I'm about to give you a key to getting over stubbornness that will blow you away, I promise. If it doesn't blow you away, I don't like you anymore. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. This is gonna blow you away. Intimacy. Intimacy with God and others. Now, I'm gonna give you a definition of intimacy that I don't think you'll ever forget. You ready? Intimacy. Here it is. Here's the definition. Into me, see. In other words, I am giving you permission to see into me. You can't imagine what would happen if you got in a group, a small group, and you gave them permission to see into you. Here, here's the problem. We don't do it because we think they would think, man, that's horrible what I see in that guy. Okay, so let me just say, by the way, if any of you think that, you're horrible. <laughs> because we're all horrible on the inside. So nobody thinks that when you get in a small group. Nobody thinks you're horrible. Actually, here's what they think. Wow, there are other horrible people in the world too. <laughs> We're all horrible. You follow me? So when you become, learn to be intimate with God and others. So I remember in my own eating habits, finally being intimate with God. It's amazing. In other words, saying to God, you can see into me. Okay? So I said to God one day, God, I need to tell you something. I don't know if you know this or not. <laughs> but when I'm tired... I really like Bluebell. <laughs> Dutch chocolate. And I like sour cream and onion potato chips. Together. <laughs> it's that Dr. Pepper and peanuts, I think it's that sweet and sour. And so I told the Lord, Lord, you've probably never heard anyone say this, but I can eat a whole bag of chips and a whole half gallon in one football game. Just want you to know, I have a problem in this area, and I, want, I need to talk to you about it. I'll never forget the Lord said to me, he said, I know you do. Would you like for me to tell you why? That's when I started getting victory. He said, would you like for me to tell you why you eat when you're tired? It was amazing. So just be intimate, okay? So here's the second point. He heard, but he didn't listen. He heard about Nebuchadnezzar eating grass. He heard about Daniel interpreting dreams. He heard about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
but it didn't make any, it didn't, it didn't do anything for him. It didn't change his heart. Same way, I've been stubborn. So I can't spend much time on these points because I read, so I want to get real straight to the point. Um, Christians can be stubborn. For years, um, I didn't pick up my dirty clothes off the floor. I didn't because I was actually mad at Debbie. She didn't know it. She didn't know I was mad. The reason I was mad is because for some reason, she wouldn't just come right out and say, would you pick your dirty clothes up? I don't know why women do this, but ladies, I'm sorry, but some of you do this. This is what she would do. She would say to me, are these yours? <laughs> you, you know, I, I, was, I said, one time I said, well, I hope they are because if they're not, I have some questions of my own. <laughs> Just say what you want, woman. <laughs> but because she wasn't, I just left them there. <laughs> That's called stubbornness. Are y'all following me? Here's number three. He knew, but he didn't learn. Now, remember I said see, hear, and know? Okay, but notice the other three words I used. Look, listen, and learn. He could have looked into God for himself. He could have listened and not just heard. Debbie says to me many times, you, you, you hear me, but you don't listen to my heart. Listen to me. Don't just hear me, listen to me. And you can learn from it. He had plenty of evidence. So, um, because I spent so much time reading the chapter, I'm gonna go straight to the, the end part, the, the how this happened and I saw this. Um, all of our children were strong-willed, but one turned his will to the Lord early, but two of my children really didn't turn their will to the Lord until they were in their late teenage years. And um, Debbie, remember, got saved at nine, I got saved at 19, but we both made childhood commitments. But she turned her will to the Lord. So children can get saved, but there are a lot of times that they don't understand, they really don't turn their will to the Lord. I believe that there are some of you here today that have never truly been saved. I think you believe in Jesus, but I don't think you ever really turned your will to the Lord. And I think today's your day. I got this so strong. I wanna give you my definition of stubbornness. Okay, this is my definition. Stubbornness is your strong will turned toward yourself instead of God. As a matter of fact, strong-willed is not bad if it's going in the right direction. My son James was very strong-willed growing up. We actually tried to use the word strong-willed instead of stubborn because we didn't want to speak something negative over him. But in our minds, we knew he was stubborn. We, there was a time, when I remember he had a ball cap. He wore a ball cap all the time. And we said to him, um, son, we're, we're going somewhere and you can't wear your ball cap. And he said, well, I'm going to wear my ball cap. And he's like eight or nine years old. And so I tried reverse psychology. Okay, that, that's a, I don't know, I, I shouldn't say what I was going to say. <laughs> But here's what I said, okay, then you're not gonna go. And he said, fine, you know, that's just the way he was. So, so when, as he got to be an older teenager, he was about a senior in high school, I, I couldn't take it anymore. And we got into one of those fights one night. Now, here's what I'm doing right now. You know, one of the reasons people love Gateway, they, they, they tell me all the time, I love that you're transparent. Okay, intimacy. Into me, you can see. So we were having one of those, James and I, one of those fights. And I finally said to him, and I hate to say this, but I said to him, 
I really don't even want you living here anymore. Because you will not listen to your mother and you won't listen to me. And I'm tired of it. And I'm going to try to see if I can find another place for you to live. That's how mad it was. And he said, that's fine with me. And Debbie started crying. And she said, I will get on my knees and beg the two of you to stop being so stubborn. Because I don't want to lose my family. And something happened in my heart as a believer and in James's heart as a person who truly had not submitted his will yet. And a few weeks later, we noticed a change in James. We just noticed a change. We would go up to make sure he was asleep and his Bible would be open on his chest and he'd fall asleep reading his Bible. He started saying, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. He started being nice to his sister. That's a miracle. <laughs> That's a miracle. So you have to understand, when he was a teenager, he was one of those teenagers you couldn't fill up. You ever had one of those? So when we would eat, he would just eat like this, you know. So we said to him at the dinner table one night, we said, James, we are so proud of you because you've really changed in the last few weeks. This is what he said. It's probably because I got saved. <laughs> we said, you, you got saved? Yeah. <laughs> we said, were you going to tell us about it? He said, he does like this. He reached over, he took his drink. He said, I figured y'all notice. <laughs> we did notice. You know why? Because he turned his strong will to God. There are some of you here that have never done that. And you need to do it today.